Okay, so hello and welcome to this ARMA webinar on the needs of children with inflammation, and pain and their families in the context of coronavirus. My name is Sue Brown and I'm the Chief Executive of the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Alliance. We're an umbrella body that brings together patient and professional organisations working uh, to work for better health services for people with musculoskeletal conditions. And we're really pleased to be presenting this webinar today. I think sometimes the needs of children with musculoskeletal conditions get, can get forgotten. And we've certainly seen that that has been true at times during this uh, COVID-19 outbreak. We hope that this webinar will allow us all to discuss some of the specific issues by specific issues faced by children, young people and families. We've got three presenters today uh, to discuss the issues from the perspective of a rheumatologist, a nurse and a parent. And if I could just ask you to bear in mind, two of our presenters are from England and one is from Scotland. Some of the guidance that relates to coronavirus is different in the different nations. So just bear in mind that um, some people may be saying things that are slightly different from wherever you are based. But I'm now going to inv invite our first speaker, which is uh, who's Nick Wilkinson, who is a paediatric rheumatologist at Guy's and St Thomas's to set the scene about paediatric rheumatology and pain. Over to you, Nick. Hello, um, so I'm Nick, yeah, and I'm based at the Evelina Children's Hospital, which is part of Guys and St Thomas's, and I've been a consultant here for now for six years, and before that, I was um, in Oxford for nine years, and before that, a year in Vancouver as a consultant, and um, what I'm presenting here is just some of the the, uh, the data that I have, and I'll just bring up and make sure, Sue, that... Can you see that? Yes, that's fine. Um, so I thought the first work was, is why did I come into paediatric rheumatology? Well, there was a, a young lad, uh, James is his name. This is actually not his picture. This is a picture from uh, a Wikipedia page, but the child I looked after was very similar to this. And he had, this was back in 96, there was no effective treatment for him then. He was um, utterly miserable. Uh, he, it would take two to three hours just to begin to get to loosen him up so that he could begin to play with just one toy which was in marked contrast to the young lad next to him of exactly the same age who had leukemia, um, who played with all the toys and had lots of support um, in, in, in all sorts of guises. Um, and that was what drew me into rheumatology because I thought, well, we can make a potential difference here. And, and I was very fortunate in that we, uh, I was part of the first trial of uh, tocilizumab, what it was called, um, it was called MRA at, back at that time. And this was in um, 2003. Uh, and so we've managed to complete the circle now for, for kids with systemic onset JIA. And the outlook for, for, for practically all of our children is fantastic. But this is not a story just about uh, young people with arthritis. It's about sort of pain in general. And what we know at any straw poll of children at school, 80% would have experienced pain, most commonly musculoskeletal pain, uh, in the preceding week or two. And if we think about sort of longer term pain, this is data from uh, the Journal of Pain uh, back in 2011 that shows uh, that uh, musculoskeletal pain is very common in this population, just as you would see in adults. And so up to 40% will have musculoskeletal pain. Um, headache, the much higher figure here tends to be adolescent girls where uh, chronic headache is, is very common. Um, and it's a similar prevalence to abdominal pain. And here's for, for back pain. So what does that mean then in terms of referral to GP? So take it. So five in this study uh, by Hench in 2014, uh, five percent of the pediatric consultations is for musculoskeletal problems. This is just at the primary care level, um, and that's been replicated in three other studies. The latter study from around Stoke showing about 10 percent of pediatric consultations are for MSK problems, and the prevalence of MSK problems actually increases with age and here this is just knee pain and you'll see from three through to 19 years of age and so we see more uh, musculoskeletal problems the older uh, young people get and in fact the commonest cause for young adults to go and see their GP is for long-term pain and the majority of this long-term pain is musculoskeletal problems um, including what a diagnosis that uh, of fibromyalgia. 
This is not just to say that it's pain, it's also long-term pain with disability. And the definition of severe chronic pain are those who have pain for at least three months associated with a loss of normal quality of life, which might be attending school, uh, hanging out with friends, uh, participating in sport. And as you can see here, the prevalence of chronic pain um, in girls uh, from 11 through to 18 is around about 14 to 16% of girls will have chronic pain that are affecting their quality of life. And it's similarly high um, in boys as well. Now, I obviously, my service is a tertiary referral service. We do see a lot of secondary uh, referrals. Um, and I think speaking with my colleagues across the network, and we, we collaborate with 16 other hospitals, they see a similar um, referral rate here, where a small proportion are, or a third of patients are referred as, does this child have juvenile arthritis? Around about a sixth, is there evidence of a multi-system inflammation? So these will be things like vasculitis, uh, lupus, um, juvenile dermatomyositis. And then by far, you know, the majority here, half, are for pain. And so this could be just a biomechanical pain, such as an osteochondrosis. This would be a persistent biomechanical pain with, uh, with disability, perhaps, that's been just sort of longer lasting. And then chronic pain syndromes, such as DRPS or juvenile fibromyalgia, if we're going to use those definitions. So just to sort of bring you up to, uh, to give some more figures, and reference points. So as I mentioned, pain in childhood is common with, a, with an 80% point prevalence for the preceding week. Growing pains, which is the definition of waking a nocturnal limb pain of, of childhood. So the child through the day is very active and then at night will wake up typically three to four hours after going to bed um, and need comforting, often some medication and perhaps rubbing of the shins. Um, and that's, that has a prevalence of 40% up to around about five to six years of age. There are things that we don't want to miss. And so the prevalence in children of neoplasia or bone tumor, so that would include leukemia, um, is about one in 100,000 children. So very uncommon. Um, septic arthritis, we don't actually have good uh, epidemiological information about that, but we do about uh, perthes and slipped upper femoral epiphysis. These are typical uh, orthopedic presentations that present in a similar order to that of children with, with arthritis. And then there are the long-term conditions. So juvenile arthritis affects around about 12,000 uh, children in the UK. Uh, CRPS, so that's complex regional pain syndrome, is something that's now increasingly recognized, obviously through tertiary services. We have known about it now, but I think it's understanding and recognition now is, is excellent at uh, district general level. Um, and that has a prevalence of uh, about one in 10,000. And juvenile fibromyalgia has a similar prevalence to that of, of arthritis. And so this is chronic, what we would call chronic widespread pain, um, rather than using this uh, terminology, which can be co confusing to parents. And then there are obviously there are all the other musculoskeletal conditions. And I don't want to, this is not meant to be a medical seminar, um, where we have the osteochondrosis and then other biomechanical pain. This is just to de demonstrate that CRPS does occur, and even in the very young, and this is a, a seven-year-old. Um, and then the multi-system inflammatory conditions here, we have scleroderma, uh, uh, vasculitis, or that's neonatal uh, onset lupus. Um, this is from Kawasaki disease, and we're seeing a lot of that at the moment with the PIMS-TS conditions. Then we have um, Sjögren's juvenile dermatomyositis and lupus. And of course, we know that 20% of our young people with arthritis get an uh, inflammatory condition of the eye called uveitis. Um, and that's demonstrated here with um, keratoprecipitates on the corneal surface. Uh, and here, what, what ultimately, if we don't treat it effectively, then they can be cystoid macular edema, and that's what, how it affects the vision. So this was just a really, uh, just a rapid uh, work through of, of how common pain is and the proportion of the other conditions that we see. Uh, so pain is a universal experience. Um, it often continues into adulthood. And, so, and we're seeing exactly the same inflammatory conditions that they're seeing in adults. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, and now um, I'm going to introduce our second speaker, who is Kit Tranta. 
Um, Kit is the lead paediatric rheumatology nurse specialist at the Jenny Lynn Children's Hospital. So Kit. Thank you very much Sue and uh, firstly thank you to yourself and your uh, Emily for the invitation to speak on this webinar today. So I've been uh, kicking around in paediatric rheumatology for about 15 years and one of the core services that uh, is comparable to the adult services, the development and, and the monitoring of a, a vice line for families and, and professionals to access for support. Um, it's a, a quick way to enable um, parents and uh, professionals to problem solve the day-to-day -day living with long-term conditions, as um, Nick was talking about earlier. Um, from the recent events, um, some themes have evolved over that. And what I'd like to do now is just go through uh, the four most common themes of problems that families have um, highlighted as being difficult over the past, past few months. Um, on my presentation, there's a whole load of, of links to various websites uh, that might be useful for future reference to various professionals listening in today. So um, I will see if I can find that. Ooh. No, lost it. Sorry, I did know how to do this. There we go. That's There we go. So first and foremost, children are not small adults. Um, the needs of uh, the, the child are particularly different to an adult patient. Um, in the first instance, you don't ever treat the patient, the child in isolation or the young person. They have an immediate family of whatever that constitutes. Um, and constantly you are always dealing with the agenda of the young person, the patient themselves, but also the agenda of the immediate family and how they react to those uh, stimuli um, of both long-term condition and problems arising from that. So the first, first thing I like that's come up over the past few months is mental health of both the parent and the young person. Um, these are uh, websites that are very, very useful to set the scene for what has become um, a, a difficult situation to a greater or less extent, depending on the, 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 the young person themselves or the family. Um, so the, particularly the Girl Guiding one, is looking at the effects of uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic um, for young women. Um, and right at the bottom, uh, give us a shout, um, young minds. Um, the, the Give Us a Shout is actually a, a useful tool to signpost young people to if they're finding um, their mental health a, a problem. Um, so it's uh, the issues that have arisen are um, a, an anxiety from the parents about taking their kids out for exercise, um, an anxiety of returning down to, uh, to school, um, the implications of COVID-19 and the media with its reporting of um, the complex uh, situations that have happened in various different uh, centres around the country. Um, all of this impacts and um, social media is a great platform by which families can communicate from, to one another, but there's a great speed of, of sharing information. And consequently, um, the use of um, the advice line to come back to professionals in whatever form is very, very useful to unpick some of those anxieties and difficulties. Um, we know that mental health um, it, problems are on the increase. Um, there's a, a heightened awareness. We need to talk about it. Um, and the impact of um, difficult mental health situations has an impact on the physical health. You cannot separate the two. And um, the feelings of uh, experiences of, of pain um, are heightened when there's a greater deal of anxiety to deal with. Um, nothing groundbreaking there. Now we have had uh, an awful lot of information about to shield or not to shield. This is an ongoing debate. It's been incredibly confusing uh, for clinicians and families alike to, to tease that out. Um, these are the, some of the websites that have, uh, we've been using to date um, and it continues to be an ongoing uh, process. Um, so the advice line has highlighted an awful lot of questions uh, from families. Well, where, what does this mean for, for me? What does this mean for my, my child particularly? How does that work? Um, 
granny is on this medication, my child is on, are they being treated the same? Um, what should I do? How do I get hold of this? Um, these are a lot of problem solving that uh, nurse specialists, particularly in paediatric, are very good at um, sorting out to a greater or lesser extent. And sometimes families are incredibly empowered and they just want to sound off to somebody else that they trust, their medic, their physio, their nurse, um, in order to clarify their own thought processes. Um, school is the big thing at the moment. Uh, this is another very, very common theme. Um, do I send my child back? How does this work? Um, trying to uh, tease that out is very difficult and has to be done on an individual basis because each school is doing things slightly differently. Um, obviously the devolved nations are attacking it in a different way. Um, and um, ultimately uh, what we are advising um, at um, my institution <laughs> is just discussing each, each family on a case by case and finding out where they're uh, sitting and how confident or not they're feeling. So we're using this as a background information of, of what to do, um, but individualizing and ultimately they're not our children, they belong to the parents, it's the parents' um, choice as to whether they go back or not. But we do have to be mindful that there is a need, um, sometimes the young person needs to go back to school because it will benefit their mental health uh, from a number of different areas. And um, so it's, it's an ongoing discussion. Um, the opportunities for making every contact count in pediatric rheumatology, we're very good at networking with an, and delivering an, an MDT service. Um, and using this uh, resource, we are very flexible um, in making it meaningful for when the young person and the family does attend um, a hospital or a, a, a care setting um, that we can then while you're here can we do x y and z i'll see if your physio is available because you're highlighting that this is a difficult you just need a, a, me a memoir it does mean that there's a, a difficulty in capturing that that work sometimes um, for um, to to prove need um, but ultimately, a one-stop uh, shop is the best way forward in order to optimise those contacts that we have with the families. It reduces the time out of, out of a normal family life and school and education and employment for the, the parent. So these are useful documentations that can help with that. Um, there's particularly some nursing stuff on there for obvious reasons. Um, and finally, from uh, mental health for us as clinicians, we like to be in control. We like to know what's going on. Uh, we like to have uh, everything, all the answers at our fingertips. And that's very difficult to deal with when we don't. Uh, dealing with uncertainty um, is incredibly tiresome and tricky at, uh, at times. So um, the first two uh, websites here are useful, um, up-to-date information from various policy. Um, the following is mindfulness and mental health for um, staff. And I'm, I've been very pleased with the response from our psychology team at the Norfolk and Norwich who have been very, very involved in supporting staff in dealing with uncertainty and not having the answers when trying to problem solve and give best care to parents and families. Um, and so they, they're useful that might be useful uh, resources that might be helpful for, for you watching today. Um, so I'd like to thank um, these two uh, resources in putting this stuff together. And a final thought, uh, which is something that I try to keep in mind every day. Um, we will get through this together. Use your uh, MDT that you have um, available. Pick up the phone to various people. Pediatric rheumatology is a small community, but quite friendly and accessible um, on the end of a phone uh, for both families and clinicians, as I said at the beginning of the presentation. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kit. That's a really useful overview of what some of the issues uh, might be for families and for young people. Um, I'm now going to invite our third speaker to talk about her experiences. Um, I'd like to introduce Sharon Douglas, who is a parent and also the co-founder of the Scottish Network for Arthritis in Children, um, to talk about her experiences and what she's learned through the, um, the members of that network. Over to you, Sharon. 
Thank you and hi everyone. Hi, so yep, my name is Sharon and I have um, a daughter who has turned 18 during lockdown actually. So that's been quite an interesting um, day for her, having her 18th birthday with all her lovely plans um, disrupted. Um, but actually we had quite a nice day at home. Um, she's had juvenile arthritis for 16 years and in Scotland, like in the rest of the UK, we have a network for parents. Um, lockdown's been difficult for us but in, but, and for lots of people, but there's been lots of positives which I actually wanted to touch on as well. Um, probably the hardest thing at the start for most people, but I'm sure you all know this, was the um, inconsistent advice about shielding and are you to shield or not. And just I guess the speed that everything came about really and the, the, the information that was shared across social media was so quick and then people were getting different advice from different sources. On a personal um, situation, we were told to shield. Beth also has Crohn's disease, so we got a letter from adult services. Beth is still in paediatrics, but adults wrote to us and um, telling her to shield. And then you were to fill in this questionnaire, but actually you could only complete the questionnaire if you were 18. She was 18 in a week, but we decided to um, just contact our paediatric team who had reassured us that she didn't need to. Um, so best, lots of people, their parents are key workers and then if they've been told to shield, this caused loads of anxiety as well because if you go to work, are you putting your child at risk? And it's about having conversations with your employers. Um, another thing that was perhaps difficult for families was that who to phone if you wanted to get advice because you were aware that your rheumatology teams were very busy, that, they were, that there was loads of changes happening and if you phone them about COVID, you were directed to phone 111, which is if, if your question, if your call is about COVID, call 111s. But then it was missing almost that individual thing. What was done really well was that families were contacted if they had a child who was high risk. They usually had a personal call from their nurse or somebody in the room told your team, which was really reassuring and helpful. And for lots of people, they've actually really enjoyed the the Zoom contact with their team. They haven't had to go to the hospital. It's been quite nice to just do a one-to-one -one conversation. Of course, it's easier when you have a laptop or a big screen, and some people are unfortunately trying to do these consultations on a mobile phone, which is actually not really working. Um, I think it's been really, I know there's a lot of physios, and actually we've had some conversation about how difficult it is to have a joint examined if you've got a painful joint, and how actually do you have that done, but with an online or a phone conversation. I guess the conversation is, how are you doing? And then if they need to be seen, they'll be brought in to be seen. Um, in terms of going to the hospital or going for your treatments and appointments, most people have found those really worrying at first, don't want to go, would rather not attend. But actually, as they've gone, people have been reassured. The hospitals have seemed to be organized. There's been good social distancing in place and good PPE by the hospital staff. And actually, people have been and being reassured and they're happy to now go for appointments. So that's been a really positive thing. Um, the schools in Scotland aren't back yet, so we have a bit of time to um, see what happens in the rest of the UK before we go back to school, which is quite reassuring for families in Scotland. Of course, the Scottish schools break up earlier than the English schools. Um, I thought a few positives were quite nice. People have actually, one family got in touch to say they'd hired a hot tub for a week. Their daughter was in quite a lot of pain. So they thought, oh, we'll just hire a hot tub, and they've done that, and that's actually worked really well. Others have done baking, which maybe so actually a lot of people feel this period has given them a chance to rest and recharge, and they're all so busy with their lives that actually it's caused them to take a pause and to just actually feel that their child is rested and they've had some recharge, they've had some family downtime, and they've not got ill, so they've, um, I haven't actually spoken to anybody in, in the SNAC network who actually has had COVID um, other than one parent, and actually she thinks her son has it, but she doesn't know, but, um, but other than that, actually people have generally been felt safe and at home. Um, I worry for the next stage, which is when the social distancing relax and rules relax, and actually the poor children who are still going to be shielded It'll be much harder for them, I suspect, because as others are allowed out to socialise more and more, they're still going to be restricted. And I think that'll be a, a, a new challenge for families. And I guess all I would hope is that the 
next stage of information that we're going to give people will be clear and consistent and given at the same time across all four nations. Thank you for having me. I think that's all Sue I need to say. Thank you very much. That's a uh, really good um, insight into what it's actually like to be on the receiving end of, of these policies. Um, so if, if anyone wants to, we've got people posting things like excellent talks, thank you, which is fantastic. Um, if anybody wants to pop any uh, questions into the Q&A box, please feel free, comments in the chat box. Um, but I wondered if, uh, Nick, you had anything you wanted to say in response to what you've heard from Kit and Sharon. Yeah, sure. No, uh, f fantastic support of talks, and I, I support both both of what Kit, Kit and Sharon has said. Just picking up on what Sharon said about you know the safety of being in hospital, and and that's certainly our experience. We get, we bend over backwards to make sure the flow of patients through hospitals is is right. The donning and doffing of PPE is good, and I think well, I mean. Uh, we're not actually talking to too many parents on this, and I think all the professionals on this will know exactly what we're doing in tertiary hospitals, and it'll be no different to to to, to, to DGHs. And so we're trying to get the message out to our families that if they need to be seen, especially for UVI to screening, which has to continue, uh, that they should still be attending for that. I know that some ophthalmology services are not doing that, and they are running um, eye, eye health checks online. But the thing is, you can't check um, for uveitis without a slit lamp. So that still needs to occur. And we need to uh, to make sure that we're not missing um, children who, who, who have got active uveitis. Um, the one difference, again, for, with, with pediatric and compared to adult services is obviously is development. And sometimes that trying to get the whole view of development is difficult. Uh, over the telephone or over a video conference and actually having the child walk in they consult for themselves um, that is really important to show that level of development and obviously watching the rapport picking up sense of anxiety is 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 important too um, the other difference is that whereas adults will will report sort of tenderness of joints that is not something that we uh, we rely on uh, with children they often accommodate uh, tenderness and pain in a different way keep going and so so features can be can be missed and so if there are uh, anxieties about whether we're missing active joints or not then we, we would like to see them uh, face to face and kit do you have anything you wanted to add after hearing what sharon had said um, yes, uh, picking up on Nick's last point uh, about activity and the ability of a young person and a child to, to cope, they do accommodate, they do adapt incredibly quickly. Um, and so the picking up on the changes in their behaviour, uh, both reported um, by the, the family or extended family, they used to enjoy fine motor skill painting or they used to enjoy football. They've what, um, decided not to do that kind of thing, or they're not, not able to squat on the floor. Um, these are, are good uh, pieces of history that are, are useful to indicate the level of, of disability that that young person is, is uh, struggling with. I think um, moving on from that, the, one of the things that is particularly problematic, and some of the, the um, participants may have come across uh, uh, adverse childhood traumatic, trauma um, as events, um, often these are, are couched in terms of time of divorce, but in our world, yes, divorce in a family is incredibly difficult to deal with, but something as uh, simple as a blood test in a, an adult uh, patient, a very insignificant investigation, if dealt with in an, uh, a, if it's a traumatic event at the first instance, uh, the point of diagnosis for a paediatric um, patient and family, um, this has long reaching implications for the management of that child and the psychological impact of that, bearing in mind that a lot of our medications are required to have um, blood tests uh, in order to monitor them safely and the, the efficacy of the, the advocated treatment programs. So what has uh, been lovely on the one hand is that uh, there's been a great deal more uh, openness to think creatively of how to input that. Um, but 
uh, from a paediatric point of view, if uh, clinicians are, are not at all sure that they can manage that in a, a good way, um, if you can leave them alone and <laughs> refer up to those who've got more experience with the paediatric, then the impact on the family is, is lessened. So yeah, that's, that's just such a simple little thing to, to be mindful of in the future. So we've got a couple of questions coming in about uh, virtual platforms and virtual consultations. Um, one is about we are managing, so this is from a paediatric chronic pain team, we're managing to run MDT clinics with virtual platforms which are going surprisingly well. Be interested to hear from Nick and Kit whether your teams are using virtual platforms and how you're getting on with them. And there's also a question about how you select which patients are suitable for uh, virtual consultations and who you should bring in for face-to-face -face appointment. Have either of you got any thoughts on those? I'll be happy to, 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 to chip into that. Yeah, no, so our team, we, we, we have a formal chronic pain service and that uh, continues. Um, we, there, were, there were two issues. One is around sort of supporting those who've already been diagnosed with chronic pain. And our MDT is working very effectively and finding new opportunities. And I think um, we've, and our patient experience is different as well. We know that the threat of school can sometimes amplify pain. And so being off school has helped some of our patients to sort of manage their expect, expectations um, and develop new strategies. So I, th I think I support what Sharon was saying, that this is a new context, that, and, and also what Kit was saying, um, that allows patients to address, uh, and families to address their issues in different ways. Um, and also what, what I found is that the level of, of connection with, with district general uh, teams, and so um, with the physiotherapists and perhaps on, on occasion occupational therapists, uh, we've had brilliant communication and everyone's just really willing to pick up the support of, of all young people, not just those with arthritis, but also those with, with chronic pain. So it's, I wouldn't have expected that, but it's been fantastic. Yeah, um, I, my uh, view on that is that although we haven't managed to do huge amounts of, of online work and video work, um, individually AHPs have been very good about making contacts, particularly with the chronic pain patients, um, perhaps individually. But what has been useful is actually bringing that information back with those individuals having an MDT meeting with all clinicians um, so that we can hear that different viewpoints are, uh, are giving us a whole picture so that we continue to give a consistent message um, when it comes to, to dealing with the, the chronic pain patients. Although um, the absence of school has often been uh, beneficial in those patients um, to help aid them in, in improving in some, in some cases. Can I just ask though, um, whoever sent, sent that in, and I, I'm trying to scan the chat to find out who, who it was, can they just email? Because it would be lovely to hear their, your, your experience um, and put you in touch with our MDT, because I think there's much to learn from this. Uh, and so sharing is, is the best way for that. That's great. Um, and there's a question come in for Sharon, which is an interesting one. Um, so there's a, a growing move across all four nations um, different, there's different restrictions, different relaxations mm. as the crisis continues. From your perspective as a parent, what can NHS staff to do to help make it more clear to families which rules apply and what they should be doing? Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, I guess the, I just actually wanted to say two things about the, um, the Zoom sessions. First of all, was just before I just answer that, was just to say that um, one of the consultants up here has actually been involved in the whole family in the Zoom chat, so the pet joined in in the discussions as well, and actually it's been a really positive thing. And parents are reassured about the Zoom chats and quite happy to have those consultations as long as they feel their child is well. But obviously when they feel their child is not quite right or has got a joint that's sore, then it, it's, it's, they're not so satisfied with those, that way of working. But I'm presuming the Zoom chat ascertains that and then you arrange them to be seen, I'm guessing is what happens. Um, in terms of advice, that's quite interesting, that question, because what we had to do in Scotland, um, there's a very active um, snack Facebook group, which is closed just for parents. And what we found at the start was that actually 
parents were posting advice from all over the UK and actually from all over the world and sometimes stuff from prayer, stuff from Europe and it was all slightly different. And then actually it was just causing such anxieties with families that actually a few families left the group, they just messaged and said actually it's too much, we're overwhelmed with information and um, there's nothing consistent. So what we've tried to do with, with Scotland is that we just try and work with SPARN really closely, the Scottish Pediatric and Adolescent Rheumatology Network. And what we've tried to do is just post what they share with us and then we post it. And then if they've shared guidelines from the Royal College, the Royal College produced some excellent guidelines and um, resources for children. We then had um, published those as well. So I guess in terms of advice, it's trying to just have a trusting relationship with your patients. I would personally try to phone people if you can, um, because people who haven't been phoned feel left out to those who have, because I know all the high risk patients are obviously the priority and the ones who needed to be told to shield, first of all. But the people who are believe their child is high risk but we've maybe got it wrong or think their child is moderate risk but we're going to shield anyway they're the ones that probably could really benefit from a personal phone call if you've time to make those calls I think that really helps good clear communication from a team that they trust as well would be a really good source rather than going on various websites across of course that's the problem with google you can find out so much information and it's all quite overwhelming so that would be, it's a long answer to that question sorry but if you have time, give them a call, is what I'd say, and direct them to good websites. Thank you. Just to add on uh, good websites, um, I don't know about Scotland, I'm sorry, Sharon, but uh, Sport England have some fantastic uh, uh, resources uh, for you know, on YouTube uh, for different ages you know how to engage young people in different levels of physical activity because it can be restricted you know obviously families who've got gardens uh, that's great or a park nearby but i think you know exercising within the home is still really important and and there's some great resources on the sport england website that's great and somebody has popped in the chat um following on from nick's comment could all teams running virtual pain clinics come together and share findings to plan for the future? Um, if people think that's a good idea, I can see a thumbs up from Nick. Um, please feel free to um, email Armour and I will then share all of your emails with each other and we can maybe facilitate that. Um, I, I think that's a great idea. Might be a good um, webinar for the future. And potentially a webinar for the future. Yeah, I'd be delighted to, to do that. I think, um, I don't know, there may be people on this uh, webinar who haven't heard about um, NHS Change Challenge. Um, there's a, a process going on at the moment about collecting some of the stuff that's been being developed for uh, to, in response to coronavirus that people want to see continue, which is open for new ideas for about another week. So in a moment, I'll pop in the chat box, uh, the website address, so that if anybody does want to go on there and make any suggestions and share anything, um, please do. Uh, it's a really interesting initiative. And there's quite a lot about um, virtual clinics and, and virtual activities there. Um, somebody's also asked about whether there's any um, MDT teams or physios or anyone doing uh, virtual group clinics. Um, I don't know if any of the three presenters know anything about that. No, certainly um, in Norwich we've not had any group work at all. Unfortunately, that that uh, stopped um, with the redeployment of a lot of our AHPs uh, into adult services, um, which is they're coming back, and hopefully will be restarted at some point, but not during the not during the pandemic at present. Yeah, I know in adult services, there are now some groups uh, that were meeting face to face that are now doing it on platforms like Zoom. Uh, so um, in, um, it, our team have been managing to do it. The Attend Anywhere uh, platform has not been very helpful. Um, Roz, uh, I see you've uh, been using the ACU treatment uh, platform, which I've heard is, is a lot better. So I think the platforms do make a difference, but I'm sure all of this technology will catch up very quickly. One thing that we are trying to do is run a workshop uh, for our patients. So that's getting 20 families in and then helping to explain, sharing the experience, continuing peer support, which we think is vital. Um, and so I think that's the next thing that we're working on. 
Okay, great. Um, so there's a question here about children with cerebral palsy who are developing biomechanical pain. Um, they usually see GP and orthopedics, physio and wheelchair services, etc. And then the services stop and they still have pain, especially for ad adolescents. Are children like these seen in rheumatology services for chronic pain? Or would the first port of call be the pain clinics? Uh, we're seeing so many children with unaddressed pain or pain shrugged off. Um, when they've received everything available in neurological and orthopedic sense, and we can't help that there really should be somewhere else for us to turn. Any thoughts on that one? I, I can pick that up. Uh, yeah, it's we're aware this is a very common problem. And I think pain, chronic pain services are different to acute pain services. And many of the services are delivered, certainly in, in England. I know that now in Scotland, they have a very good network for, for chronic pain. Um, Leslie Colvin uh, running that, and she, 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 she's brilliant. Um, that's up in Scotland. There is now a building community. Uh, there should be access for those with uh, cerebral palsy to chronic pain services. Your orthopedic service may know that. Certainly, the Evelina we have that, and the Great Ormond Street that's the case. And I, you know, places like uh, Manchester and Leeds, those services are developing. And um, going on from that, I would advocate uh, highlighting through an incident form uh, the numbers of patients um, that are in need of these these chronic pain services, uh, particularly in in smaller centres where there isn't a particular a paediatric chronic pain service there, highlighting that this is a risk, highlighting that this is a need, um, so those children can, can get what is, is required. But also to think about the psychology of it too, and to um, perhaps discuss with any psychology service that you may have access to, whether there is capacity to take on specific patients where there is, there is difficulty um, going along with the holistic um, approach to, to management of these cases. Great, thanks. And I've just put the NHS Change Challenge website in the chat for anyone who does have uh, thoughts and ideas they'd like to post. Like I say, that's open for another week or so. Um, and it would be great to get some more paediatric examples in there. So I think we've possibly come to the end of the questions that people have posed. Um, I think it would be good perhaps if we could end the webinar um, with each of the presenters just saying one or two key points that you think are really important following on from this discussion. Uh, should we start with Nick? Uh, uh, so there was, oh, just looking back through the chat, I saw that someone asked about whether joint injections are continuing. Certainly we've continued joint injections uh in in our service i don't know sharon are you aware of that uh up in scotland sorry about that yeah a lot of people have been persuaded to have them under gas and air rather than um with anesthetic and there's i'm sure you're all aware of the really good video by what why children in hospital um, which shows um, a child having joint injections under gas and air. So we've just been sharing that and actually people have been really scared beforehand but they're reassured again when they go to the hospital. The staff seem to be just so organised, the hospitals just seem to be so clean, they just seem to be so quiet, so organised. I don't mean they're quiet, they're not really busy, I just mean there's not crowds of patients queuing everywhere. I know you're busy. Um, and I think because the parents are so reassured by the staff that, that they just then feel at ease and the joint injections are certainly going ahead. Um, but I only know people who've had them under gas and air. I don't know anybody who's had them by anaesthetic, but there are probably those people who've had them that way. I think, the uh, sorry. I think there's uh, been a uh, hesitancy in using steroids uh, during the pandemic. Um, certainly in our service, we haven't had any patients requiring uh, joint injections under GA, which has been wonderful because the capacity to, to deliver that has been challenging. 
and would have been challenging. Um, we did have the capacity to use gas and air and certainly on an individual basis um, there are children that, that can cope with that and I agree with you Sharon that the uh, What Where uh, Children website that SNAC have put together are excellent videos in their authenticity to help young people cope with, with difficult situations. They are filmed with real clinicians, with real patients doing the real procedure. There's no, no actors involved. Um, so a, gr a great deal of authenticity there and very useful. Um, so uh, I think the uh, ability to give uh, joint injections has been a little bit hit and miss across the country based on just our snapshot of um, experience. And I, I know all the tertiary centres are working very closely with the, the district general hospitals. They're still up and running because, you know, there, there may be long distances to travel. Um, we run uh, debriefs for clinics, so the local paediatrician will will do telephone conferences or even see patients locally and then give us a ring and we'll go through everything. So we, we're still ensuring that best practice runs for all patients. And yeah, we're, we're still we're recommending the versus arthritis app. Uh, I see that uh, Alison Dolan has uh, just posted that, uh, and uh, and because again, it's another resource that's just very helpful uh, and can be shared uh, online as well. Yeah, same here. We've got families using it as well. It's great. Yeah, and I think that was one of your resources, Kit, wasn't it? On your slides was a link to that. So we'll include that in the uh, post webinar email. Um, okay, so we've got just a few minutes left, so perhaps if uh, each of you would like to just um, say one or two key things that you want to, to end on after that discussion, um, should we start with, uh, start with Kit? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the, the take home message that I'd like people to hear, um, certainly if they're dealing across the lifespan, is, is to remember that uh, children are not small adults. They do have particular needs. They do require specific paediatric services and the paediatric services, particularly in rheumatology, are very friendly. Pick up the phone. Um, we don't bite. We don't have all the answers, but sometimes two brains are better than one. And uh, the cross networking discussion, um, either within your own MDTs or nationally, um, are very, very useful. So keep on talking, guys. It's great. Excellent. Thank you. Nick, did you want to say any last thoughts? I just support exactly what Kit was saying. Um, we are still very much open. We're thinking in the new ways uh, and we're collaborating across with, with our GPs and across the network. Great. And Sharon, a, a final word yeah. from Sharon's perspective. Thank you. Yes, I just think in this um, in this next next steps ahead, it's just trying to keep all the information consistent and constant and to try and just keep the communication as good as you can, to try and keep talking to your families and um, that to think of the siblings, the parents, and just that pressure that has been on the whole family when with the child that's been unwell. I think the children who are still going to be shielding in the future is going to be very, very difficult for those families. And it's just trying to support those as best you can and thank you for listening, thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you found that useful. Um, we will have the recording up online um, at some point in the next day or so. Um, and you will get a link to it and the resources uh, probably on Monday. Please do share it in case there's anyone um, that you know who might benefit from um, listening. Um,